The story of Bessbrook can trace its roots back to 1761, when John Pollock opened the bleach green in the townland of Clockervin. After acquiring the property from James IV, Earl of Charlemont, many believe the village is named for his wife, Elizabeth, and the small brook that runs through the outskirts of the village, which would eventually power the village itself. The bleaching business thrived, and soon a mill of 1,024 spindles, a scotch mill and a hackling house were employing people in the area. The Nicholson family bought the mill and it enjoyed success until the mill was burnt down in 1839. The buildings lay derelict and the townland began to suffer. But through this disaster came opportunity. And this is where our story begins. Hi, my name is Robert. I was born in Bessbrook in 1860 into a family of eight. Bessbrook was a different village than it is today and I was born just as the main village had been built. Things were different for me than kids today. I spent most of my time playing up in the woods with my imaginary friend, Theodore. We had to be a bit more creative about playtime back then. While the village of Bessbrook was growing, many of the residents sought work in the mills across Ulster. The influence of many Quaker families across the province led to an industrial organisation which helped to stabilise Ireland after the famine. It was only when John Grubb Richardson sought a new location for his own milling operation, branching out from his father's operation in Lisburn, that the mill really took shape. My family have worked in the mill since before I was born. My dad worked in the scutching mill and my mum was a weaver. My brother Francis started working in the mill, but as a 17-year-old, he found it hard to stick to the rules. Where'd he go, Mackey? That's not my problem anymore. One day I came home, and Da had some news to tell me. Bobby, where have you been? In the forest, Da. I wouldn't have to give Mr Wright your letter, only for a moment. A moment you could have been spent with your family doing something useful. Show me those nails. Go wash up, you're a disgrace. And make sure you do your work before you go to bed. Yes, Da. Oh, and Robert, it's time you let go of that imaginary friend, don't you think? Yes, Father. Bessbrook had grown from a one-street nucleus of Fountain Street in 1860, and the next two decades saw the addition of High Street, Charlemont Square, James Street, Frederick Street and Thomas Street, with College Square completing the core village in 1880. John Grubb Richardson saw the need to build a temperate and controllable colony, so developed the concept of a model village in the area. With no pubs, John believed that there would be no need for police or pawn shops. Many of the residents abided by the laws of the village, but it was by no means compulsory, rather strongly advised. However, those who didn't follow the rules would feel the consequence. When I was younger, my father used to tell us stories in the evenings. Stories about his father and his father before that. And they always used to say how it was going to be easier for those that follow. Your father worked in the mill too, didn't he? That's right, Robert. Although the mill was a different place before the Richardsons came to Bessbrook. I thought Mr. Richardson built the mill. No, son. Mr. Richardson came to Bessbrook after you were born and he rebuilt the mill after it was burnt down in a fire. Many men were out of work and the famine made conditions very harsh. Did your father lose his job? No son. Worse than that. He lost his life and I had to grow up very quick and look after the family. Son, there comes a point in every man's life where responsibility comes. 
Growing up is always an opportunity and it's your decision to embrace it or ignore it. Your brother Francis chose to ignore it and followed a path that brought him to where he is now. Where is he? That is not my concern anymore. My concern is this house and your brothers and sisters. And now that's your concern. Robert, you're to take Francis's place in the mill starting tomorrow. Tomorrow? You've grown of school and now you must contribute to the home. You're younger than most, but Francis has left you in this spot. But Father, I don't want to. I'm scared. I just want to go and play with my friends. You'll do as you're told, Robert. Now off the bed. You rise at five to get ready. But... Off the bed! Tomorrow's a big day. Robert, that means your friend must be gone by morning too. That was a shock. I didn't think I had to start so young. Most of the village work in the mill, and a lot of people complain about the conditions. The long hours, and I have to get up at six every morning when the mill horn sounds. The mill horn was a loud sound that was heard all over the village to start the workday off. If the bitter cold in living in a 19th century house doesn't wake you up, then this certainly will. By 1880, the Bestbrook Enterprise was now the Bestbrook Spinning Company Limited, employing over 3,000 people in the area, with each year growing its net income. The Bestbrook Mill enjoyed success from the decline of the cotton industry in the US as a result of the American Civil War. It was also at the forefront of milling technology, as Bestbrook was among the first in Ireland to make use of the steam-powered looms. From plant to product, the flax process has many stages. When the flax is harvested, it begins the linning process with rippling, retrieving the flax seeds from the pods. Next is the retting process. This loosens up the fibres by soaking the flax in water. The scotching process then beats the straw to remove all the wood matter, making the long fibres become line flax and the short fibres as tow and woody waste known as shiv. Hackling then draws the fibre through a series of blocks containing different sizes of hackle pins to remove the final pieces of straw and tow and to comb out the long fibres for spinning. Once the yarn is prepared, it can move on to the weaving looms. The weaving looms in Bestbrook were among the finest in the world, with huge floors filled with the machines. Linen was being produced in huge quantities and the demand was evident across the world. Many people have fond memories from the exquisite quality the linen had and this was also reflected in the living conditions of the Bestbrook residents. At the end of the 19th century, Bestbrook was a thriving village and John Grubb Richardson had set the village up to be aesthetically pleasing, with attractively flowered central squares and wide open streets. He also set up a dispensary and doctor, using a small payment from the employees' wages as a subsidy. While many can debate the altruistic nature of the Richardson family, it is also likely the Richardsons improved the quality of life for their workers because healthy workers were more productive and lost fewer days to sickness. The building and subsequent managing of the area meant that Bestbrook would see the next century focused on the improvement of its population's quality of life, and opportunity was within grasp of many residents in Bestbrook, including young Robert. Every day is a new adventure. Last week I saw a cricket match being played in the halls. Although the conditions are harsh, this is the opportunity that the Richardsons gave to Bestbrook to build a legacy.